in last week's nightcap, I briefly showed this main safety lamp I'd bought for Deb for Easter. I've had a lot of interest in this, I've had a lot of comments on it, and I've done a little bit of research online and I've found out quite a lot about them. I found out how to open it and basically how they work. These lamps were invented by a gentleman called Humphrey Davy in 1815. Prior to then, miners would use an open candle while working underground and there's a lot of methane gas underground and explosions were very commonplace. What Humphrey Davy invented or worked out was that a flame wouldn't pass through a piece of fine gauze. The gas would go through the gauze but the flame couldn't get back out. So the first miners lamps didn't have the glass in, they just had a piece of gauze with a flame inside it and the, the flame would burn but it wouldn't ignite the gas. The miners, being miners I suppose, weren't very happy with the light output so they would take the gauze off and expose the, expose the naked flame which did cause many explosions. The later development, it's got a glass in there and it's also got a lock so you can't open the lamp up. There was two main gases in coal mines. You had methane which is fire damp which burns and you had carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide which is what they call black damp which is a suffocating gas which comes after the fire. It was basically used for illumination then it was found out that by carefully watching the flame and adjusting the flame you could, with skill and practice, work out roughly how much gas was in the atmosphere if it was explosive or poisonous. And that's why the, the safety lamp became equally important as a gas detector. I'm going to open the lamp up. I've got some real strong magnets. These go on the bottom of here and allow that to open. There's a little metal catch in there. I'll get a close-up shot of that a little bit later on. There's also a rod there which stops the top from coming off. So once you screw the bottom off, button screws off, that's the wick. Little that rod there drops down and allows the, the bonnet or the top to be unscrewed. Once this comes off, you can see inside the gauze. So the gauze would allow air gas, flammable gas to go in there and it would affect the burning of the flame but the flame couldn't get out through the gas so you didn't have an explosion. That's how a safety lamp works. So that comes out of there and the glass comes out of there. This lamp is a little bit of a special one. It's got one or two features on that aren't normally found on miners lamps. One feature is it has got a method of relighting the lamp on the ground, it's got a flint in there, you press that in and the flint sparks and that would light the wick. Also on the side of here it's got a little nipple and it's also got a little valve on the bottom of there that opens some little ports which allows the air to go in through the bottom of the lamp or to stop it going in through the bottom of the lamp. Yeah, test gas will be injected in the air through like a, probably a bubble, balloon type thing. And the gas would burn with a different degree. The flame will be higher or lower depending on what the gas was it put in. This was probably used as a training lamp to train deputies in the use of the main safety lamp. I'll bring the camera in now and get some close-up shots of the various parts. This is obviously the base of the lamp, it's quite heavy to stop things falling over. That's the wick there, it's got a little adjuster on the bottom, a little wheel, so you can regulate how much wick stands up or comes down. That's the clever bit, that's a little magnetic lock in there. If I get the magnet, and the magnet pulls down a little piece of metal in there and that's locked. This is to prevent it from being opened underground. This is part of the lamp body. In there is a little flint and you get a little striker which goes in and that produces a spark which would light the, the lamp up on the ground because once the lamps are sealed on the ground they aren't opened up again. There are the ports on the top 
and they're open now so they would allow the normal atmosphere to go in and if you close this that closes them off so you're only going to get air into the lamp that you inject in this is the gauze double gauze clever how it works like I say it would allow a flame it'll allow gas through but it won't allow a flame to come out of it in the bottom of here inside there there's a ring of copper tube with holes in that's connected to that port so you can inject gas into the lamp body now we'll put this back together there's a gasket in the bottom and the glass goes in there's another gasket on the top then the two gauzes sit on top of there and the bonnet screws on I'm going to use this lamp, I'm going to light it but I haven't got any suitable fuel I've been told you can use Coolman type fuel or lighter type fuel right so that's the lock there that locks the bonnet on and obviously it's held up with that pin right and the bottom screws on And once again, that pulls a little, I don't know if you can see that or not, a little steel pin in there, and that pulls it down, that's the, main, that's the lamp lock, so now it's safe again. Your striker goes in there. And that's how you light the lamp underground. I hope you enjoyed that little bit of video um, about the, the safety lamp, as obviously I don't know that much about them, just what I've read on the internet. I have got a quite a strong interest in mining, uh, more metal mining, but coal mining is also interesting. Anybody that's got any more details, uh, feel free to comment or email us. Anyway, Deb does like a, a lamp. I didn't get a close-up of the front with the name, I'll do that now. And it's got L-Y-N, Col, which will have been Lainmouth Colliery. Protect a lamp and lighten. It's a 6RS, Type 6RS. It's got something on here, A57. So that could be 1957, I don't know. Got some 4 mil aluminium to cut. These are for a model tank. This is a job I do quite a lot, I've got to put a 67mm hole through there in drill and tap some M6 holes on the outside edges. I normally do it in a 4 jaw chuck and I space it out so there's room for the boring tool to go through and you end up juggling around with bits of metal and drop them and it's a bit of a pain in the arse. So what I've done is I've bought some of these little rare earth magnets, so I'm going to put them on. They're all really strong little things. Just like the spacers to keep the piece of aluminium spaced off the, the chuck. I mean they won't be mega accurate, the same size, but they're going to be very, very near. Obviously they won't stick the aluminium, that's not the idea. It's just to hold ourselves in place 
and then all I'll do is simply bring in the lathe tail stock onto there, kind of roughly square it up. And if you wind each join and turn, I'm not going to run it fast, and there's no way that magnets are going to come out of there. So straight away, we're going to be fairly well lined up. Right, next, take it out of there. Put another centre in. We run a clock gauge on there, it's going to show how accurate we've managed to get it. The closer to the chunk you can get, the more accurate you are. Clumsy bastard John. Right, I'll bring the camera around so you can see. Right, so that's within probably six or seven thou. So we'll just find a high one, which is that one. A little nip on it. High one again. That one. Give them all a nip and then we'll do it again. It doesn't matter if I damage the size of the machine because it's going to be get machine round. Right, so we'll get two or three throw there. High point again, which is that one. Half a throw. Right, so that's pretty good. speed steel boring bar I've had for years we worked really well at aluminium Fanny's here, which is two tenths of a mil basically. Not, not going to be here. Sixty-seven. Once again, it's just time to say thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing. If you haven't subscribed, please do, it does make a big difference. Anyway, thanks for watching.